we said during the authority of the believer study that we've been doing that the two prayers that will never work are praying for Jesus to do something that he's already done and asking him to do something that he told you to do. And so a lot of times we'll pray, God, would you save this person? Would you work in their life? And I believe he, he knows our hearts, but the reality is he told us to go. Look at the person next to you and just say, he's talking about you. Okay, so he's just talking about the person next to you. I'm not talking to you. But he's told us to go. And, and that's Marcus's heart. He, uh, there's no better person when it comes to equipping people. Uh, Marcus is uh, somebody that has the opportunity to speak all over the world. We were talking last night about some Middle Eastern countries that he uh, goes and shares the gospel with and countries where you go to prison and can lose your life for the sake of the gospel. And he has just no fear. Uh, over the years, he's been part of planting over, uh, you know, 2,000 or so uh, home churches. And at some point, you just kind of start, stop counting. But God has used him uh, in incredible ways, and you're going to be blessed uh, today by his ministry. By the way, don't forget to give. You'll see the information on the screen. Welcome, Marcus. Are you good? All right, so this is a Sunday morning service. Let's get to it, right? Uh, if you don't see me with a big Bible, it's simply because I'm getting old. I cannot read the Bible on stage anymore, so I memorize it nowadays, okay? All right, so I'm going to give you three Bible verses in the beginning about our topic today. We have a beautiful topic. You want to know the topic? Okay. Love. Feels good, right? Feels really good. Now, I'm going to give you three Bible verses, and knowing people, most likely, you will feel under pressure when I give you these three Bible verses. It's weird, right? Ever felt weird and under pressure in church because somebody gave you a good Bible verse, you know it's true, but immediately your soul felt like, why is he saying this this morning? That's tricky. You know what I'm talking about? All right. Shall we start with the first one? John 21, 15 to 17. For all of you who write down, for all of you who open the apps, whatever, John 21, 15 to 17. And all the real Christians in here, they know it by heart, right? You, you know it. Everybody else, repent. Read your Bible more. Okay, I'm starting already, right? John 21, 15 to 17, everything has happened. Jesus died on the cross. He rose on the third day. The disciples saw the risen Jesus. Peter knew he had betrayed Jesus three times. He had heard, he had heard it all. He knew he had messed up big times. Jesus said to Peter, what did he say? Do you love me, Peter? Oh, there's this nice word, right? Love. Come on, everybody wants to have a Sunday morning service with love. Right? It's a good message. Love. Shall we say it together so you really get into the spirit this morning? <laughs> Come on, let's say it. Three, four. Love. No, that was not romantic enough, guys. You know, usually in a good church, you say, like, get an, an amen, and then nobody says amen, and you say again, like, amen, and everybody says amen this morning. Romantic, okay? Some Romans in the room. Okay, three, four. <laughs> oh, some of you got it. The under 21 ones, right? <laughs> You're too young to use that word, my friends. <laughs> Far too young. I'm just kidding. So Jesus asked, do you love me? And Peter says, mm -hmm. right? I don't think he was too confident after all the stuff that happened. But he said, mm, yes. I hope your husbands don't sound like that when your wife asks you, right? Like, um, so far, at this point of our marriage, I might say so. No, no, no. 
now, right? Yes, I do. No, Peter was scared and righteously so. And what does Jesus say? Come on. Feed my sheep. Anybody here feeling pressure? Ah. You know, when Jesus asks you, do you love me? It's connected. It's connected. It's easy in worship, like, I love you. And you already hear the voice. Feed my sheep. Ah, come on. And Jesus asks again, right? Do you love me? And Peter says again, probably with a bit more confidence or less. I don't know. I wasn't there. I'm not that old. Anyhow, so Jesus says again, feed my sheep. And he asks a third time. And this time Jesus says, feed my lambs. But I don't know why Jesus changed it. I really don't know. I ask him many times, why was it two times sheep, one times lamb? I don't know. It's not my topic this morning. My topic is love. And my topic is, if you are like me and you read that, you immediately feel, feel pressure. You feel the pressure. Loving Christ should lead to an action. And when it leads to an action, I have to do something. And it's Sunday morning and we were all at the all-white game last night, or at least at home, right? And it was late last night, and Sunday morning, I want to hear a positive message about love. I don't want to hear, if I love Jesus, I have to feed his sheep. It's not a message I need Sunday morning. Right? I, I understand you. Come on, I understand you. Jim made awesome breakfast for me. If I had known I'm getting a message where love is connected to hard work, I would have not come to church. Let's stay home one Sunday. It's nicer. It's just nicer. So that was the first passage. Second passage is even worse. You all have heard it before. You all have heard it before. Mark 12, 29 to 31. Mark 12, 29 to 31. The Pharisees asked Jesus, what is the most important commandment? What is the most important commandment? And what does Jesus say? Come on, you know that all by heart, right? Can I hear it loud, lady? I don't know your name. What's your name? Ruth, you know it by heart. Come on, give it to us. <laughs> Woo! Yes, that's the greatest commandment. That's the greatest commandment. We're so busy with all the other stuff. That is in the core. Shall we say again, love? Come on, a bit more romance in the room? Probably you should look at your wife so you feel it. Okay, look at your wife and then say as romantically as possible, love. That doesn't seem to work in this church. We have to work on your marriages, Pastor. No, I'm just kidding. Again, right? Loving God is the only thing that matters. And then suddenly, loving your neighbor. And there it is again. It is connected. You can feel love, but that is feeling love. Loving is being active. Now, one thing that America brought to the rest of the world that I don't like is nowadays when you quote Mark 12, 29 to 31, and you say, love your neighbor as yourself, what's the first thing that is preached in Christian churches? Say it again. Who's your neighbor is what the Pharisees ask. That, I think, is a fair question because there are so many neighbors around, it's hard to know all of them. But the first thing nowadays is taught, you have to love yourself first before you can love somebody else. That was not when you grew up, right? That was not a sermon topic when you grew up. You were simply faced with the fact, love God first and love your neighbor. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong, right? If Jesus loves you, you get an understanding for who you are. That is positive. But nowadays, a lot of times I'm in a church and people tell me, I, I challenge them with this Bible verse, and the first thing they say is, but I have to love myself first. 
you can make out of this whatever you want to make out of it. I think that's not what Jesus said. He just said, love your neighbor like you love yourself. Come on, be creative. You know how you want to be loved. Love them as well, right? So, so I don't mind you loving yourself. Please look into the mirror and think like, praise God, he made me that beautiful, right? <laughs> Honestly, that's, that's what you should feel. But suddenly, oh, I cannot laugh because I have to go to five more seminars and three more worship nights. So I finally love myself enough to love others. That is a bit tricky. Okay. Shall I stop preaching or can I go on? You're with me on that, right? Is that okay? Yeah? So, so I'm trying to work at it because that message is positive. You can love God. You don't have to be afraid of God. You can love God. And if you love God with all your being, it will transform you so you start loving others. And you might not love them perfectly, but there is some love. So start with that love, right? But if you're like me, you read that scripture and immediately you think like, Ooh, wow, so difficult. And you might regret having come to church this morning. I know. Shall we go to the third passage? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Which one do we choose, Josiah? John? John 15? John 15, 17. John 15, 17. John 15, 17 says... The greatest love is to give your life for your neighbor, friend. Oh my goodness, now love becomes even dangerous to your health. <laughs> right? It even becomes dangerous to your health. Suddenly love doesn't just make you do something, it costs you something. Now if you feel pressure, I understand it. I understand it. So let me tell you three problems with love this morning. Okay? Three problems with love. Problem number one. You never know if the other person feels loved. You only know if you feel loved. It's a very profound statement. Let me say it again. I don't know if my wife feels loved by me, but I know exactly when I don't feel loved by her. Does that sound familiar? Right? That sounds very familiar. You never know if the other person feels loved. You only feel your own love. Of course that's clear, but that means we are at problem number two. Problem number two you never know how much love is enough love. Is that true? If I listen to my kids, my kids have a very clear understanding how I should love them. If I would take all the candies that you guys donate for the homecoming and I take it to Germany and I give it to my kids, they will feel very loved. I know you kids are different, right? Yeah? Um, I know that my kids feel very loved. If my youngest comes into the room and he says, Daddy, any idea what I could do this afternoon? I know exactly what he wants to hear. I think you should watch some TV, my friend. <laughs> he feels incredibly loved. I've been married for 20 years. My wife is awesome but I never understand that my love is never enough. She always has ideas how to love her better and more. <laughs> Why are you clapping? <laughs> and you know the worst thing about the whole thing is, my wife, her name is Stephanie, she is awesome. She is really absolutely awesome in making me work harder on myself. Anyhow, so my wife, after I have worked since 4 o'clock in the morning, after I have prepared, after I took the kids to school, after I did lunch, after I vacuumed the living room as a man, 
Definitely. 37 minutes past 9 o'clock in the evening, she would say, why is the garbage not brought down? <laughs> With that tone, right? With that exact tone. Now, I don't live in America. I don't have a nice house where everything is ground floor. I live in a city center. We're on fifth floor. I've been up for ages. I've done it all, honey. I've done it all, honey. Come on. One detail. Five, five, what's the English word? Flies? Stories. stories, five stories down, five stories up. Oh my goodness. She knows exactly how I should love her. I know exactly why she should not ask me for one more sign of love today. <laughs> Enough, honey. That's the problem with love, right? That's the problem with love. First of all, first of all, you never know if somebody else feels loved. It never feels enough. And then the worst thing happens. You need third problem with love. You need to figure out if this love is appropriate. If the way you show your love, is it appropriate or not appropriate? I gave you the example with my kids and sugar. My kids know exactly how I should express my love to them. My dentist would be happy if I would show my love, like my kids wanted. They would make a lot of money with my kids. It's not showing appropriate love, right? It's not. There are a lot of people, especially as a leader, who tell me all the time how I should love them. There are people in my neighborhood who express very clearly how I should love them. Leave that parking spot for me, my friend. They would feel very loved. In the inner city, my goodness. It's that parking spot. No, you don't get it. I don't care if you feel loved or not. But you're getting me, right? So there are three problems with love that we all face the whole time. You don't know if the person feels love. You don't know what it is, if it is enough, the way you love. And you don't know if your love is appropriate. And that's how Satan gets you. Now, I don't know about the wives in the room, but sometimes... I feel towards my wife. So first of all, I did not expect you don't feeling loved. I feel hurt that my wife does not feel loved by me. Secondly, honey, I think you should be happy with the amount of love I give to you. Thirdly, I've, oppress, I've expressed my love in a way that you should understand. You should really understand it. I gave you one hour of my precious time today. Feel love, dear. You're getting the point, right? Now, if you approach love like that, you still stick in a very legalistic approach to love. It is still, is it enough or is it not enough? Is it enough or is it not enough? Have I done enough or have I not done enough? And if you're smart enough, you immediately think about the consequences. And the consequences are, so if I love this person with all my heart, with everything I have, I get sucked into his life, I stop living, and I have no strength, no power, no anything left for anybody else. That makes perfectly sense to me. And then, of course, coming back to the Bible... Then you have Bible passages that are really used to put people under pressure instead of setting them free. Let me give you one example. Anybody in the room has ever read the story of the Good Samaritan? Right. You have heard it in... All of you have grown up in a Christian family. It was in, kinder, in children's church. It has been with you your whole life. So let's just go through it. So Jesus is asked, after being questioned, what is the greatest commandment, he is asked, so who is your neighbor? And Jesus tells a parable. And he says, one man traveled from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on the way, robbers attacked him. They took all of his belongings, and they left him half dead on the side of the road. That's the story. Now, one guy came, a priest, a pastor, somebody high up in the social and spiritual hierarchy, he sees the guy, he just passes. Jesus doesn't say why he passed, 
He just passes. A Levite came, somebody also high up, considered very, very holy, come, passes, goes. The Samaritan, despised by the Jewish people, being considered not part of God's family, comes and does what? He first does first aid, right? He does first aid. He puts him on his donkey. He brings him to the next guest house. He leaves him at the guest house and tells the guy, take care of him. When I come back and the money I give you is not enough, then I will give you more money when I come back. That's all the passage says. Do you agree with me? Now, Satan knows that when it comes down to love, we can be manipulated like crazy. First, we are all very selfish people. I am, probably you're holier than me, most likely you're holier than me, but I'm a very selfish person. I realize that the older I get, the more I get it. So finally, the Holy Spirit really convicts me. I start to change, and I start to laugh. I start to see people around me. I start to see needs around me. And Satan cannot stop me anymore from loving people. So he kicks me in my rear and tells me how I should be loving people from now on. And he tells me, coming back to the Samaritan, there's somebody who needs you. You have to give him all your time from now on. Whatever he desires, you should help him. And did you see he doesn't feel loved? So probably you didn't love him well enough. What's wrong with you? Are you really a good Christian? So instead of me being free to love and help, he sucks me in the opposite direction. I suddenly am slave of what I would say a devilish definition of love is. Really a devilish definition of love. I'm not anymore free to love. Suddenly there is a new legal system telling me how am I supposed to love. Now this morning I would like to move one other step with you guys. I'm going to give you two short stories of my own life. Two stories. I'm not telling you these stories because I think you should do what I did. I just want to give you two random examples of how I learned to love. Now I will give you three short points, really hoping that you will take it into your life so you become free to love in a godly way. Okay? So first story. I have a friend. This friend used to deal with drugs. He got his first girlfriend pregnant. Finally, when I met him, he had just accepted Christ. For the first time in his life, he was getting his life under control. For the first time in his life. The father of the girl who had gotten pregnant years earlier, he said, I hate you for becoming a Christian because up until now I could hate you for what you did to my daughter. Now I see how you have changed and that you're a trustworthy man. You're coming back into my daughter's lives. And I see that you're starting to be a good father. I hate you for being a Christian because I would have liked you to stay out. That's what her father said. And I understand it, right? As a father, I do understand all these feelings. Oh, my daughter's turning 18. I, I feel the inner warrior in me all the time somebody shows up. Anyhow, right? So we're talking about a guy who came out of misery came out of misery. So I started to mentor him in the whole process. One day, and, and understand, they were not married yet. He had just come to Christ. The lady he had the child with had just come to Christ. They were distant. They kept safe distance. They were moving towards a marriage. They were holy. It looked very, very good. Very, very good. I was so proud of the guy. One day he calls me up. He was crying like crazy. He said, two days ago, the mother of my child and my child died in their flat because there was a monocarbon poisoning. What are you going to say? You cannot say anything, right? Don't ever tell people who are in trouble, God will make a way. Or God will have a reason. Come on. Don't ever dare to say something like that. 
the week after he was, a, he was in sales, he came to Berlin. He stayed in a hotel. I visited him. I took a whole evening out of my schedule just for this guy. I went to the hotel. I said, how, how, my friend, can I spend tonight with you? He said, it was a fancy hotel. He said, let me call the lobby. He called the lobby. They brought up an electronic guitar and an amplifier to the hotel room. He said, Marcus, you play guitar, right? Yeah, I do. He said, let us just worship. For four hours in that hotel room, I played guitar and he screamed. He just screamed. That was not worship. He just screamed. He told God everything he felt. How disappointed he was that he'd still trust God, that he would rather be in heaven with his former girlfriend, future wife, and the mother of his child. Four hours. Now, I would never dare to tell you this is how you should love everybody. Right? I would not tell you, visit everybody in your neighborhood with an amplifier and a guitar and let the people scream. <laughs> You're getting me, right? You have to be that close to just be in the situation. But yes, that would be my challenge. Would you know and would people be willing to open up to you that strongly? Let me tell you the second story. My friend Matthias. Now, this guy was brilliant his whole life. He finished A-levels, straight A's. Honest, honest student. Came from a very broken family. He evangelized like crazy. Every girl he fell in love with accepted Christ and got baptized. The problem was, he fell in love every three months. <laughs> You're getting me, right? I had to take him out of the team because even though I knew he loved God like crazy, his lifestyle was unacceptable. So when I took him out of the team, he said to me, so you're treating me like everybody else. If I don't perform, if I cannot perform in one area of my life, I'm the bad one, I'm taken out. I said, no, Matthias. I know that this is the lie Satan is going to tell you. I have to take you out because your lifestyle is unacceptable and it will mess up the church. But from now on, every Wednesday morning from 7 to 8, I will meet you one-on-one -on -one in one of the local bakeries. I will pray with you. I will have breakfast with you. I will read the Bible with you because I will not allow that Satan gets you or that you believe the lie that you're not good enough. I have to make sure the church is good, but I will show you love by giving you one hour every Wednesday morning. And for everything else, I will be there, but I cannot allow you to corrupt the church. Now again, I'm not going to tell you you should do the same thing. But do you feel like that was love? <coughs> so I cannot tell you how you should live. But I can give you the three things that I would like you to write down. And you should annoy your pastors with and tell them, teach us more. Teach us more about those three things. Now, the pastors don't know that you will be annoying them with it. But you can come back to me, right? I'll give you more ideas. But those are three things I really want you to annoy them with. The first thing is, learn to decide how you want to laugh. You have to decide how you want to laugh. Now, that is a spiritual thing. The world will tell you how to laugh. And there are a lot of ways that culturally might be appropriate or not. When I come to State College, the first moment I feel laughed is I get this amazing basket that Pastor Zach personally put together for me. He went to the supermarket and he chose that salami and that drink and that banana. I think he handpicked the bananas, right, Zach? <laughs> I, I know you always claim it's your wife, but I think you just want to give honor to your wife. I think you just are a very humble person who handpicks it himself. That's what I want to believe about you. <laughs> right? That is a culturally appropriate way to show love, right? Now, please learn to decide how to love people. 
how much time do you want to invest in getting to know people and getting to know people better? You, a lot of you are very good with your schedules. You know exactly how to be successful at work. How much time do you want to invest? How many times do you want to show up in your community? Now, I'm not saying spend less time in church. I'm just saying how much time do you want to spend with people outside church? That is something you have to learn. Honestly, in my opinion, American churches are met much better than German churches in being generous with money. So please decide how much money you want to give to people who cannot make it. But on the other hand, be very clear about who you should not give money to because the people should work for themselves, right? Yeah. All this kind of stuff, right? So you have to... But do you get me? It's a spiritual decision. It's a spiritual decision. Don't spend time with people because people want you to spend time with them. You have to make a decision who you want to spend time with and how much time you want to spend them with. Now, I'm making that point so clearly because you make the decision how you want to love. You cannot let other people make the decision for you how you should love them. Shall I say that again? If you learn to love, if you want to love like Christ loves, you have to learn to decide, this afternoon I'm going tailgating. Because there is this guy from New York I want to meet again. I want to meet all his friends. It's my decision. That is my decision. If the guy is drunk and doesn't remember me, that's his decision. I cannot be... I cannot feel, hey, I spent two hours of my valuable life to find you and visit you. That's his decision. I'm in charge for my decision. He is in charge of his decision, right? Now, if you decide, because whatever happened, you give somebody $500, that's your decision. Make that decision. Be confident about your decision. If the guy says, can I have another 500 that's his decision. You're not in charge of it, right? Now, I'm making that point so clearly because... Deep down, we want to be praised for the love we give, right? We want to be acknowledged for the love we give. So we know that this guy wants us to love him in a certain way, so we might express our love in the way this person wants, because we, on the other side, we like to be loved, we like to be praised, we like to be acknowledged for the love we give. But honestly, that is the love that will not help that person. But if I show my love in the way that helps that person, at least I'm convinced it helps that person, the person might feel like, why did you do that? Sometimes tough love is the only love that matters, right? And sometimes tough love is telling per a person, I know you now for three years, the way you talk to your kids is dangerous to your kids, and it will destroy your family if you don't stop. How many people are happy if you tell them? Right? So I have to decide, this is the way I want to love. It will not be affected by how you treat me back. That is tough, guys. I hate it. You know, I really hate it. I would like to live a different lifestyle. I would like Jesus saying, giving me 10 rules like, okay, you get up in the morning, 8 o'clock, you meet your wife, you say, good morning, honey, do you want a coffee? That's the only way I have to show love to her the whole rest of the day. I could say, take, laughed her enough for today. <laughs> it would be so happy. It would be so good. It would make my life easy. Right? I go down on the street. I find the first person that I see, and I say, my friend, I want to tell you about Jesus today. Take. <laughs> the one evangelism for today, done. <laughs> it would be so easy in my life, right? Then, okay. I made 200 bucks today, 20% for the Lord. I don't need to think about money for anything else anymore because tick showed my love financially well enough. Bam. It would be so easy. I would love it. It's not my life. It's not my God. That's not how he treats me. He tells me, my friend, go to state college. We're all white. <laughs> that one was good. I like that one. <laughs> but you're getting me, right? So... Decide how you want to love. Learn to be independent from if you get a positive reaction or not. First thing, okay? Now, that will be tough. That will be so difficult. 
Uh, you pastors should be busy because they all come back and they complain. I want to laugh more and they didn't like me for it. You know, that would be a good church. They're coming back to you saying like, yeah, and this neighbor, and then I reached out, and now this neighbor is on my porch every afternoon for three hours. I don't know how to get rid of that neighbor. <laughs> that is a luxury problem. That would be a church where, okay, now we can talk about how to deal with a neighbor that just chews off your ear. That's a good Bible study class too. Right? Until that happens, oh my goodness, learn to reach out stronger, right? So that's the first thing I want you to learn. Second thing I want you to learn is decide who to learn how to laugh from. Decide who to learn how to laugh from. I say it again, right? It was a long sentence. Decide who to learn how to laugh from. Now, that point is very important. I meet a lot of pastors, I meet a lot of church leaders who tell me my congregation is lazy. Pastor Zach never did it, just to make sure you know that, okay? Not that you think he tells me what I should tell you or something like that. No, no. So, I always tell all the pastors, never <laughs> believe that your people don't want to do it. Always assume that your people lack the creativity to do it. Does that make sense? We live in a sinful world. We all have very limited resources. I don't know how much you work. I look at my schedule. My schedule is crazy. If somebody tells me laugh more, I first think when. <laughs> That's clear, right? I have very limited resources. I have three kids. I have a wonderful wife. I have to take care of it. And everybody around me always knows how I should love them. They never sit down with me and say, Marcus, can I look at your schedule? Oh. I see, no, compared to all the other people that are in your schedule, I think I'm not that needy. It's okay, you don't have to meet me. That's never what anybody does to me. They come and they say, we have to talk, Marcus, we have to talk, we haven't talked. That's the pressure on my life, right? So anyhow, so what I'm trying to communicate here is, you have to learn who you want to learn from. Is there somebody in church that you can go with one afternoon a week for two hours and see how that person reaches out to people you would not reach out to. It would enhance your creativity. I hate to preach about evangelism because usually the church leaves after the sermon and says like, okay, another sermon about evangelism. He told us now that we are all bad when we don't evangelize, but nobody knows what to do afterwards. Right? No, decide who you want to learn from. Now, can somebody in this congregation, just get up and point at one person and say, I want to learn from that person how to love others? Just one. Anybody here who feels like I can learn from that other person? Who are you thinking of? I'm thinking of my friend Rose that comes to my home every day and helps me get things in order in my home. That's awesome, right? Now, a lot of times we are not learning because we are not looking for the people we can learn from. Does that make sense to you? I might look creative to you. I still need a lot of other people to learn from. A lot. And I deliberately look for guys like that. I sometimes just float along somebody else for a whole day to just look at it. Because I need to be inspired. My creativity is very limited. Okay? So please, take time. Go and approach people. Right. Third thing, because we're going late. Third thing, now this is, this is the churchy thing now. Decide that you want to be led by the Spirit. Now I'm going to say something. But decide to want to be led by the Spirit. If you're like me, your life is full. You cannot decide to work less a lot of times. It's just your schedule. But you can decide, I'm going to the supermarket now. Before I leave my car, I will take one minute to pray in the car and say, Holy Spirit, I need to have open eyes for the people in the supermarket. You go to pick up your kids from school. I need to be open for the people that pick up their kids from the supermarket. I do not just want to have the small talk. I want to have this one extra question in. I want to have that extra positive statement in. This one thing. 
I would always advise you to have a time with the Lord in the morning and say, Lord, is there anybody, is there anything you want me to do? Any name today? Any name, any person? So, of course, I like the stories. I have not personally experienced that. But I have a friend. He prayed in the morning. He believed Jesus said, 1107, bus station on that corner. You have to be there. There will be a young woman with a red purse. I would like the Holy Spirit to lead me like that. It's not what I experience every day. And he baptized that girl a couple of weeks later. Now, that is my dream, right? I don't experience it every day, but I would like you to expect that it happens more strongly. Are you getting me? Don't complain that you're not having it like that. I would like the Holy Spirit tell me, so Marcus, today this is your schedule. So you don't have to think about it. I just put it in your Google calendar already. I would like that. I'm a structured person. Bam, 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 done. Tick. That's not how it works with me. But I want to be the person who expects him to talk. Now, I said a lot. Are you still here? Can I come back? Or was the sermon that bad? I should never come back. <laughs> Can the worship team come up on stage? Awesome. So, you want to tell your neighbor one thing that you got out of that sermon? Just one thing that you got out of it. Tell your neighbor one thing that you got out of this. What did you get out? You can, of course, turn around, Audra. You can talk to the guys behind you. I would like us to really pray this morning. I know it's common to pray for a fresh anointing from the Holy Spirit, right? To have that desire to know God's love in a way I cannot contain it anymore. It has to break through to others. That is a spiritual thing. Now, the fruit of the Spirit, love is one of the nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. That takes time to grow. But this morning, I would like you to expect that you really feel the love of God in a way you have to let it out. Is that a good prayer? You want to get up? All of you who are sitting, you want to get up? It's more like a polite question. Like, I think Americans are very polite. So in Germany, I would say, get up. <laughs> huh? But, all right. So tell the Lord, probably you have been ministering to people for a while. And honestly, when you look at what you have invested and what came out of it, it's not in a good proportion. Some of you might have loved people for years. You might have reached out to people. But when you look at the outcome, it feels like I invested so much, so little fruit. I understand you, sister. Feels like that in my life sometimes. Some of you feel like, yeah, okay, he was funny, but what did he talk about? Then take one message. I want to be loved by God and I want to love others. And Lord, this morning I need to feel your love in a way I haven't felt it before. I need to be touched by your love. Some of you heard the part with, if you are not creative, you're just like everybody else. But find people who are creative. And that is your responsibility. Your pastors cannot tell you that. You have to start doing that yourself. So I will give you some time to pray while we're singing. And then I will lead two or three steps in prayer. your eyes closed the first thing I want to pray for this today is 
I told you the story about the Good Samaritan. We have all been there. We were all overwhelmed at one or another point in our lives with the suffering around us, and we just ran by. We just didn't stop. When I mention that, you might remember one situation in your life where you know you didn't. It might have been yesterday, it might have been 25 years ago, where you knew somebody needed your help and you didn't. Now in the kingdom of God, there is forgiveness. And that story might have been on your heart for the last five days or the last 30 years. I just want you to say today to the Lord, yes, that's true, that was me. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Don't allow Satan to hold that against you. Don't allow Satan to tell you, you are like that. See, you were back then, you were like that, you are going to be like that. No. You live in this world, you made a mistake. You come to Jesus, there is forgiveness, you are not that person. Are you getting me? But speak it out. Tell the Lord today this one situation that Satan is having you with, that Satan is nagging you with, and he tells you, see, you cannot. You might have had a friend who was willing to hear the gospel, but you did not know how to do it. You might have had a neighbor and you knew the problem, but you were overwhelmed with your own life. That was you. You confess it today. Forgiveness will be there. That don't allow Satan to hold it against you. That is going to be over after this morning. Amen? Come on, you talk. You pray. Brothers and sisters, I speak forgiveness into your lives this morning. When we confess our sins, when we forget, when we confess our shortcomings, He is faithful. He has died on the cross. We confess this morning because we know we failed at one point or another point in our lives. But you, Lord, died for all of that. We are not people who do that. We are people who have done it and we are set free. And Satan has no right to come and nag us with it. I used to be that person. I'm a person who will grow. I'm a person who will learn. I'm a person who will become more creative. This is not me. I'm the one who follows Christ. And when I follow Christ, I'm going to be like Christ. And I'm going to be that person that sees opportunities. I'm not the person who is afraid. And I can say already today, Lord, you will prepare a way for me. You will give me new ideas. You will give me new friends that help me to have ideas. You will open up my eyes to see opportunities. And I will take these opportunities. And if for whatever reason, I'm stupid enough to make another mistake, I will not allow Satan to tell me again I cannot do it. I will get up and I will say, it is forgiven. Tomorrow's a new day. I will do it again. Amen, guys. Amen. 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 Now I said, I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. And I would like us to pray this morning. If you say, this is not how I have acted in my Christian walk. I don't take those minutes in my day to say, Spirit, lead me. I need to learn that. I need to have a sense for that. I need to have a film with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask you to come up in front in a second. So you can make up your own mind if you want that or not. But I want to talk with all our friends who are here for the first time. You might not know why you're here this morning. You might have not understood too much of the sermon. But when you know in your heart today, it's time to come back to the Father. You better come home today. If you know today it's time to come home to the Father, 
You make a decision. You might feel unworthy. You might feel like you're not good enough for the people around. The person who invited you, invited you, and you don't even know why he invited you. But this morning, you hear in your heart, you can feel it. It's time to go home to the Father. Then you better go home. And I can promise you one thing, because that's one of the stories that Jesus said. The Father will have just been waiting for you for ages. He has just been waiting for you that you come home. And He will not wait for you and be careful with you. He will run towards you. Every step that you make towards Him, He will run 100 steps towards you. And He will take you in His arms, no matter how you feel. He will put a wonderful new suit around you. And there will be the biggest party in heaven ever. And we are from, and I can promise you we'll celebrate with you as well. So all the eyes are closed here. If you can, if you know today is the moment to go home to the Father, then I want to see your hands now. I want to see your hands now. Today is a good day to go home to the Father. Can I see the hands? All right. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. By the way, this is the message, the first message you should have out there. The Father is just waiting for you to come home. He is just waiting for you to come home. Don't bother them with anything else. The Father is just waiting for you to come home. He is just waiting for you to come home. That's the first message. Everything else comes later. Okay, guys, if you say, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in a fresh way, I need to hear His voice, I need to be the person that just, I don't know, I just need to be better where I should go and what I should do, just come up in front today, the pastors will pray, you see I will pray, I will pray, it's a good time, come up in front. There's enough space. Uh, by the way, not just women are allowed to come in front. Guys are welcome too. Sometimes in church you have to say that. Just come up in front. It's a good time to be prayed for. It's a good time to have a fresh anointing from the Holy Spirit. This is awesome. Anybody else? Let's just start and pray. Yeah, let's just start and pray. You guys will continue, right?